it's right for us to take just a minute as our musicians make their way off the stage to just say thank you. Thank you to all who made this day possible. I want to thank our 60th anniversary committee led by our own Linda Nissen. Thanks to our amazing worship directors and all of our musicians and technicians. Thanks to our creative services team who kept this event in front of us for the past several months. And thank you to our youth and our children for their help and their energy. And thank you, each and every one of you, for adjusting your schedules to be with us this morning. It's not every day that we get our whole church together in one room for one service. Although I have to admit, I kind of like it. It would be a special treat for us to be able to do this regularly. So, thank you. I'm going to throw our team for a bit of a curve. I'm going to deal with our text today. Uh, I'd just like to read it. And do we have 15, 8 through 10? If we, if we don't, then I'm, I'm just going to read it to you. But if, would you stand for the reading of God's word? Very short passage. Jesus says, Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Please be seated and let's pray together. Lord, I thank you for uh, this great day this amazing opportunity for all of our church family to gather together in one room for one service. I thank you for this opportunity to celebrate your faithfulness over the course of 60 years and to recognize the simple, humble sacrifice and commitment of believers year after year, Sunday after Sunday. In the way that you have moved within the people within the city to touch and affect the lives of countless thousands throughout the world. You are a good, gracious, and merciful God. You're so bright and brilliant and perfect in your plans. And we are living testimony to the power of God to change one single human life and the power of God to move within his church to change the world. And I pray that that will be what we're about as your church called Colonial. For that is who we've been for the past 60 years. And may it be who we are in our future as we move ahead. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, over the past several weeks, uh, Jesus has painted very vivid pictures of what it means, of what it looks like to be his servants and his disciples. Each picture found in Luke 14 and Luke 15 speak directly into our vision for Colonial's future. First, in Luke 14, Jesus commands his servants to invite the poor, the blind, the crippled, and the lame to a great feast that he has prepared. And then he continues, and he tells his servants to go out onto the highways, into the country lanes, and compel all people to come in. This picture of that Luke 14 banquet has so captured my imagination over the last several months that my vision talk today was compelled and and informed and really based upon that Luke 14 passage even from several months ago. And, and and, And the concept is this, that God wants them all. He is not content to have some. He wants them all in. And so obedience to Christ demands that we go out and we invite them. You know, our youth ministry, you've probably heard about this, our youth ministry modeled this kind of inviting uh, on President's Day weekend when they hosted a feast for the crippled, the homeless, those with special needs, and random strangers off the street. Many of those who came to the banquet hosted by our youth were not only invited, they would probably tell you they were pursued. (laughs) Our our, our youth literally took vans uh, down into the urban core, and they, they literally hoisted up Uh, people in wheelchairs and put them on the van and brought them to this feast. And this is the picture that is so consistent with both Luke 14 and then as we make this adjustment into Luke 15, when Jesus tells of the good shepherd who leaves the 99 to pursue the one that is lost. If we are going to follow Jesus Christ for the next 60 years in this church, we will both pursue and invite those who are far from God. 
So the first part of our vision for the next year or so at Colonial is an aggressive commitment to pursue and invite the lost, the last, and the least, to pursue and invite all people, to compel all people to come into the kingdom of God. Our commitment to invite must begin with people who live within walking distance of our two locations. I have been charging and will continue to charge the leadership at both sites to initiate ways to serve our neighbors so that we might have the opportunity to invite them into a relationship with us and more importantly, into a relationship with Jesus Christ. And I'm gonna tell you right now, when those initiatives come, I'm just gonna ask every one of you to really pray about getting plugged in in any way that you can. I know some are very young and some are very old. But these initiatives matter. The more that we demonstrate love and mercy and care to our neighbors, the better the opportunity we have to share the gospel with them and to show them the gospel. We're very excited about the community garden that's taken off at uh, our Quivira site and the wonderful welcome presence of our new friends from Homes Gardens at Warnell. These are just, you know, simple illustrations of the fact that it just takes some creativity and some effort and thought to be inviting. But it is my hope that we will all commit to making ourselves relevant and welcoming to the people who walk by our campuses every day, those who drive by every day. And many of you have ideas. You have visions for the ways that we could serve our neighbors, for the way that we could engage with the people who are right around the places where we are. It's time to step up, share your ideas, and lead some initiatives. If you have ideas you want to present, take them to your site pastor, to your site ministry team. And then there are those who are beyond just the local pr proximity of our, of our two sites. I'm going to point to those who live in the same neighborhoods that we all live in. Many of them, many of our neighbors are far from Christ. The mission field is all around us. For example, one of the groups that remains uninvited in our culture, in our neighborhoods, are those who moved here from other countries. We have a huge international population in Kansas City many of whom are Hindus, Muslims, or other faiths. We're currently looking into a mapping software that will tell us the native tongue of every family in our neighborhoods. Imagine what would happen if we committed to pray scripture over those families for weeks, and then we shared the Jesus film that was translated in their native tongue, and we invited them for coffee to just discuss what they saw in the video. There are a myriad of approaches we can consider, but I want you to know that we are committed to equipping Colonial with resources and strategies for reaching our neighbors. You know, discipleship begins where you are. So I'm challenging each person in our church, every one of you, to commit to inviting one person or family per month for the next 12 months. We've actually provided, we're gonna provide you these little 12 pack of Colonial cards to pass out, one per month, but before you think that's self-promoting, listen to the way we want you to use the card. Our challenge is that you will simply pray that God provides an opportunity for you to invite one person or family per month. When the moment comes and the Holy Spirit prompts you, write your name and phone number on the back of the card and invite people to connect with you. Invite them to connect with you personally before you invite them to our church. That personal connection is so much more important than simply getting them to our church. Even if they never come to our church, you may have the opportunity to engage your neighbors in a conversation about Jesus Christ. I know you might feel comfortable with this. Listen, here's what the gospel says. If we're going to be followers of Jesus Christ, we pursue and invite people who are far from God. That's what we do. That's how this church became this church. The great banquet is at hand. We must compel them to come in. Another part of our population that is increasingly forgotten and uninvited are those who cannot get out. In the next 10 to 20 years, a huge portion of our population will be elderly and unable to attend church. Already we're being led to bring the gospel to the retirement communities that are popping up all over our metro area. I envision a team of people committed to this ministry that helps create environments like the one created at Brookdale Place. Each Saturday, this small group meets for fellowship and worship, they watch the message from Colonial, and then they compete in Wii Bowling. I mean, how cool is that? I had a chance to hang out with them. What a great group of people. If you have a heart for this kind of ministry, of, of taking the gospel in the church into these places where so many people are living every day on the edge of life and death, 
would you please see Betsy Vickner or contact me or one of the site pastors? We'll help you get connected with that team. You know, one of the key reasons that we fail to invite certain people is because we wouldn't know what to do with certain people if they came. For example, we don't regularly invite people with addictions. We don't regularly invite people who are terribly depressed or lonely. We don't regularly invite people who just got out of jail or those who have obvious habitual sin in their lives. But as I read the scripture, that sounds a whole lot like the kinds of people that Jesus said he came to seek and to save. Those are exactly the kind of people that Jesus said, invite them, compel them to come into my banquet. So in order to prepare for all people and all their uniqueness and brokenness and with all their stories, we have been working on a new path of discipleship that will begin soon here at Colonial. It begins with what I like to call a spiritual eye exam. This particular uh, environment will be known as Become, and it will be a great place for all of us to learn about the factors that often hinder our spiritual growth and keep us from becoming fully devoted followers of Christ. Let me tell you something. You don't know what you don't know. In other words, we all need some help in seeing what areas of our lives or our thinking or our worldview has led us to become spiritually stuck You'll be hearing more about this new model of discipleship in the near future, but our vision for Become is that it will empower us to meet all people where they are, help people to self-identify what areas need to be addressed in their spiritual life, and then lead them to self-select into the next step towards spiritual health that is appropriate for their particular situation. This model of discipleship will demand a huge number of gifted leaders, teachers, and even Christian therapists. But we, we are that church that can provide this kind of environment so that all people when they come can be received for exactly how they are and who they are and we can, we can kind of tailor our discipleship path for their particular needs. I believe all of us would feel more confident in inviting all people to the banquet if we knew that we were prepared for all people. If you have interest in being part of this a new discipleship path, I encourage you to contact me or with site pastors or our new staff person who's leading this, Kim Jones. We're so grateful for Kim. Now, we need to get into the weeds for a little bit, and I'm going to ask you to bear with me. When it comes to inviting people, each site, our Quiver site or Warnell site, has its own opportunities and its own challenges. Let's begin at Warnell. Our Warnell, uh, our Warnell location is quickly becoming one of the most diverse intersections in the metro area. Whatever direction you face from the parking lot at Warnell, you are looking at a unique demographic. Slowly but surely, I'm very excited to say, our attendance at Warnell is beginning to reflect some of the diversity that is in the surrounding community. In the past few, year, uh, past few years, but particularly in the past year, we've had some students from India join our church family, as well as several African Americans and other minority groups. I mean, we really have it all at Warnell. We have the old, the young, the wealthy, the poor, whites, blacks, Asians, special needs, I mean, you name it. And I can't tell you how excited I am to see that kind of diversity beginning to, to, to make itself present at our Warner location. I believe God is pleased and, and very much desires to bless a congregation that has its arms open to all people to come and hear the gospel and follow Jesus. Our diversity is a strength at Warner. It's also a challenge. Our current worship schedule, featuring multiple worship times and styles, inevitably, not intentionally, but inevitably segregates the Warner congregation and kind of increases a sense of generational isolation. The sense of isolation is magnified by the fact that we have a sanctuary that seats 1,100 people with two Sunday services that rarely exceed 300 people, so the room constantly feels mostly empty to us and those who come to visit. Another challenge that many people have when it comes to inviting people to our church at Colonial, whether it's Warnell or Quivira, is our use of simulcast. The use of simulcast has been essential in bringing a sense of commonality to our two congregations over the past five years. But the use of simulcast requires, if you think about this, it requires that I tailor my message to both congregations at all times. Let me tell you what that's like. Imagine that you have two kids. One's a boy, one's a girl. When you're parenting your two kids, there's many times when you talk to both of them at the same time. But imagine how limited it might be if you could only talk to both of them at the same time. 
that's a bit of, of the limitation that comes with the simulcast. So sometimes my sermons have to stay just above the place of implementation at, at one or, or, or both of our sites because we're doing different things. And so one of the ways that we're looking at, at kind of addressing some of these challenges is this particular part of our vision. Beginning very soon, we will combine the two services at Warnell into one large worship service that will unite the whole Warnell family and leverage the space that God has given us for his glory. I am convinced that the energy and vitality created by one unified worship experience at Warnell will be pleasing to God and to our church family at that site. Now, before you pull out your PDA and start texting me, <laughs> let me tell you something. When we make this move to a unified service at Warnell, we will turn off the simulcast. The new schedule will allow me to preach the one unified service at Warnell every Sunday at 11, and I will be able to preach the 8, 9, 15, and 6 services every Sunday at Quivira. Only the 11 o'clock service at Quivira will utilize the recorded sermon from the 9, 15, but I hope to be in the Quivira lobby every Sunday to greet those who are coming to the 11 o'clock service before I scoot over to Warnell. This change will allow me to maximize my time and presence in order to bring contextual leadership to both sites from the pulpit. In other words, when I preach to the Warnell location, I will be able to directly champion and lead the initiatives that are happening at Warnell. When I preach at the Quivira location, I will be able to do the same, to champion and lead those initiatives that are unique to Quivira. Session and I believe that this change is necessary for the next season at Colonial. It's likely not a permanent change, but it makes sense for the next 12 to 18 months. So I'm going to ask you to bear with us with this, but I think you'll love it. Now, at our Quivira location, we have early signs of growing pains. Attendance is up about 8% over last year, and that inevitably leads to some parking challenges. Thankfully, we've got permission to park on the grass, but we know that very soon, 400 new multifamily units will go across the street, will be built across the street there on 135th. So we have to develop a strategy for inviting our new neighbors, even as we invite our current neighbors to come and hear the gospel. I'm asking our leaders to anticipate growth and to resume the work of a master plan that will prepare us for accommodating growth should this trend continue. One of the areas of immediate concern at Quivera is our facility for youth ministry. The beloved old house affectionately known as the Q is likely, it's wonderful, but it is likely inadequate for our growing youth ministry. And should we eventually sell the property on 135th, it will immediately go away. Given that the economy is recovering and we're getting some hints of interest on that land, and we are, uh, the trustees have voted to go ahead and list that frontage property and some land uh, along Quivira, um, I have asked Kevin Tews, one of our leaders here at Colonial, to assemble a team who will begin to plan for how, where, when, and what we will eventually do to provide adequate space and facilities for our youth ministry at Quivira. Even if we never sell the property, I do believe our youth ministry will outgrow that facility, so we need to be ready. If God is stirring you to be part of that, that steering team, please contact Kevin Tews or Pastor Bob. I want to say that I'm very, very excited about seeing a growing Hispanic presence in our Sunday worship at Quivira. This is exactly what we've been talking about. This is the product of a family who has just invited people into their lives and invited them to come to be part of our church. Southern Johnson County has a large and growing Hispanic population, so we're now faced with the new and exciting challenges to translate the Sunday message and create appropriate environments for our Hispanic neighbors. Again, if you're interested in that part of our outreach, please contact our site pastors. Finally, before we move on to the next part of our vision, I want to say something. When I first came here five years ago, you know, it was clear to me that we were in a place where because of the two sites and a lot of transition, a great deal of the congregation was not feeling cared for. And, and that was really nobody's fault. It, we just had no systems to really create care for such a large group of people. I want to acknowledge and, and thank our Colonial Cares Ministry. How many of you have been touched by the Colonial Cares through cards, through flowers, through somebody visiting, through, you know, through a death of the family? I mean, if you start looking around, there's an awful lot of us. I can tell you that in any church, there's always a tension between being aggressive to reach those who are lost and disciple those who don't know Jesus and caring for and ministering to those who are part of our family. You have to be able to do both. And I'm, thanks to the Colonial Cares Ministry and hundreds of people who are serving as volunteers in that ministry, we are now able to really pursue 
both. And I want to thank the excellent staff and all those who serve with our Colonial Cares ministry. Now we need to shift gears. We saw on Easter Sunday that Jesus demanded in Luke 14, 25 through 35, that those who would come to him must be ready to give up everything in order to follow him. Jesus commands our obedience and our surrender. He calls us to be all in. And I'm pleased to say that I'm hearing from you, from your families, more and more of these all-in kind of stories. In fact, we'll continue to share those stories like we did with the Powells last week. We'll share those stories throughout the year. We want to hear your all-in story about the way that God grabbed hold of you and called you to do something that felt crazy, that he changed your heart, that he led you into his mission field. We want to hear those stories. Those stories are important for us to hear. Part of our vision for Colonial is simply to amp up our level of surrender and commitment to follow Jesus. You know, you know, literally to get a bit radical, if you will. The world will never know we are disciples of Jesus Christ if our story doesn't sound at least a little bit crazy. Spending a few years in the Gospel of Luke has convinced me, and, and I hope you're kind of getting this too, that our Lord will never be content with casual commitment or minimal effort. Jesus Christ gave his life for us. We are called to give our lives back to him. How that all-in commitment plays out in your individual lives, in your families, is not something that I can predict. Clearly, he wants us to invite, to serve, and to give. I will say that at a congregational level, we have an opportunity to come all in together and get out of this blooming debt once and for all. Amen? In November of 2011, we had $7.8 million of principal. At that time, when we launched the campaign, Colonial was being litigated against in two states by our former denomination, and we didn't even know if we would own the property associated with that debt. Nevertheless, after much prayer, the elders called us, the, the church, to trust Jesus under extreme circumstances as we obediently began our work to get out of debt. And that's what we did. Through the power of God's Holy Spirit, Colonial won the court cases, and we eliminated just under $3.5 million in principal in 16 months. That is nothing short of a miracle. I just need to tell you that the session has gone back to the Lord. We continue to pray about this. We spent considerable time in it in our session retreat in January. And after praying about the remaining debt, the session has discerned that God is calling us to finish what we started, to eliminate the remaining $4.3 million in principle. And we are believing God that this debt will be totally 100% gone by the end of this year. We're trusting God for that. You're thinking... I knew it. I knew that guy was crazy. That settles it. <laughs> Would you look around in this room? Take a good look around in this room. Is there anything that this group of people filled with the Holy Spirit cannot accomplish in this city? No. You can't think small when you think of colonial. Now, here's the thing. How much glory would God receive when the whole watching world Here's, that, here's a church that in two years' time eliminated $7.8 million of debt, and the first year of that, they had no guarantee that they even owned their property. That under persecution and litigation, they committed themselves to obedience, and God blessed it. That is a story that will bring God glory for the ages. It is an all-in story. It's kind of crazy. I like it. Let me tell you something. This debt is a ball and chain that brings no pleasure to God. The economy could tank again at any time and leave us stuck with this debt for another decade. With the stock market at an all-time high, now is the time to finally rid ourselves of this debt. Please, please, please pray about doing what you can to finish the task. I continue to believe that this story, in some weird way, will define us moving ahead. It hits us where it hurts the most. It's kind of crazy. But I would, I'm, I would just want to tell you, I'm trusting God. We are going to be out of this debt. And we're not going to get any, any more debt anytime soon, I can tell you that. 
Now, as we've done every Sunday for over two years, let's consider our text for this morning. And I appreciate that all of you know that this was supposed to be held three weeks ago, that I'd done my entire message around Luke 14. And I delivered that message, not to 2,000 people, but to about 300 people on our snow day. And, and, and I have just trusted God that he, he's put me right where he wants me in the text. And this, you know, the text that I read to you today, this beautiful, tiny, little three-verse text about a woman who has lost one of her silver coins. One of her ten silver coins is missing. She's supposed to have ten. She only has nine. And Jesus states, does she not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, rejoice with me, I've found my lost coin. You know, this story is similar to the parable of the shepherd who leaves the 99 on the hill and searches for the lost sheep that's you wandered off into harm's way. But this story is different. Listen, the difference is so significant and it's so relevant for the rest of our vision. You see, the picture of the lost coin differs in the way that something is lost. The sheep wanders off because it's a sheep. The prodigal son wanders out of rebellion. But the coin, you see, is not responsible in any way for being lost. It's just lost. It's missing. It's powerless to be found because it has no voice. Someone has to go look for the coin. Light must be applied to locate it. The house must be upset in order to find it. The search will require great care and persistence. But why bother? I mean, it's only one coin. It's not worth all that much. I mean, couldn't this woman just cut her losses? No, you see, because the silver coin in this story represents most likely one of the ten coins on her headdress. And that headdress represents that she is married. That headdress represents her identity. If one of the coins is missing, it affects her identity. Listen, this is the picture of God's heart for the lost, particularly those who are misplaced and hidden in the world. These lost souls are part of God's identity, his self-chosen identity. He is not content that they should remain lost or misplaced. There are two groups of people who fit the description of lost coins in our world today. There's more, but there's at least two that we're going to focus on today. Number one is the orphan. And number two are those people who have never heard the gospel. Our vision at Colonial is to join the Lord in finding both. Within the past five years, Christian leaders all over the world have heard God's call to rescue orphans at an unprecedented level. Our own Joan Kinetic, who is now, you know, the, the guru of the Global Orphan Project, we were talking the other day. He said, Jim, I'm convinced God's not calling the church to the orphan. He is sending the orphan to the church. I believe that it's absolutely correct. God has moved his hand and claimed the orphan and abandoned children on this planet for himself. He is sending his children to his church, and we need to be ready. Since 2008, Colonial has responded to this orphan challenge by establishing partnerships and orphan projects in Haiti, in Malawi, and in Kenya. Thanks to the mighty hand of God, Colonial's obedience and generosity, and all of our God-honoring partnerships abroad, Colonial now joins God in rescuing hundreds of orphans in these difficult parts of the world. But now we are hearing God calling us to engage the search for lost children right here in the metro area. Listen to some sobering statistics from our backyard. In Jackson County, there are currently 1,746 children in foster care, which is a 20% increase from last year. There are 392 foster families in the entire county. Only 30 to 40 of those foster families will take teenagers. Some 2,000 children enrolled in Jackson County schools are homeless, and the average age of homeless children in Jackson County is seven years old. Let that soak in for a minute. In Johnson County, it is estimated that there are 1,000 homeless children enrolled in schools. There are five or fewer licensed foster homes that take teenagers in Johnson County. Johnson County DA estimates that 650 children will enter foster care 
in, in Johnson County, and 150 will have parental rights terminated by the end of this year. As of a few months ago, there were 61 children from Johnson County who were waiting adoption without an ident identified resource. In addition, uh, and I went actually to the Johnson County Courthouse and sat through a day of, of juvie court, or a couple hours of it anyways, and this is what we learned. We actually went back to the judge, uh, his quarters, and, and had a conference with him. And what we've learned is that for these teenagers in particular, where parental rights are terminated, where they're stuck in the foster care system, there's no place for them to go. And so kids who run into these difficult times, many, many of these kids, it's not their fault. Their parents are really messed up or whatnot. They're plucked out of their school, they're plucked out of their peer group, and they're sent down to Wichita or Western Kansas. There's just no place for them to land in Johnson County. So when you look at that whole picture of the Jackson County, Johnson County, what's happening in our backyard, and we listen to where is the Lord moving, we are not in doubt that God has called the church in Kansas City to step up and to care for God's children who are orphaned or homeless in our city. Our vision that Colonial will partner with the Global Orphan Project, other local churches, Kids TLC, and other local government agencies to create solutions for God's children who have no family and no place to call home. I recognize the complexity and difficulty of this vision. Each child has unique challenges and circumstances, but these are God's children, and I feel quite certain he's calling his church to bring them in. So the first ask I would make of you is this, that every household in Colonial would pray and ask God if he wants you to adopt a child who needs a home in our city. Pray about it. Be open to God's leading. For those of you who sense God calling to adopt, take the next step. We will, in partnership with the Global Orphan Project and all those who have a similar heart for this, we will provide information meetings, foster training, and support groups for you to consult with. There is a training opportunity coming up this Saturday, April 20th, when representatives from Texas Christian University Institute for Child Development will be at Macedonia Baptist Church to host a one-day training on the impact of abuse, neglect, stress on a child's brain development, how to parent or to support someone who's parenting a child or youth from this type of background. You can find out all the details on the Global Orphan Project website. Now, many of you are saying, but I don't, I know, I don't, we're too old, we're too young. I mean, we don't feel called to adopt. Okay. But I'm going to ask you to commit prayer support, financial support, coaching, free piano lessons, whatever it is you can do, uh, transportation assistance, whatever you can contribute to families that are willing to adopt these children into their homes. There's another possible model that we're considering. The project is suggesting that churches invest in a home, a house. It's called a church-owned home model. We're very interested in this model for the Clavier location, particularly because of the need for transitional space and nurturing for teenagers. The concept is that the church buys, builds, or rehabs a home and hosts a family to, to bring in, okay, so the, we would build a home. One of you, as a family, would be willing to live in that home and serve as house parents for kids that just need a place to land and, and need a sense of family. But these are probably not kids that would be adopted. We would, we would adopt them into our family, the church. These kids are homeless, or they simply cannot return to their homes for any number of reasons. In this model, the whole church serves as the family for the teens, and we support the host family by relieving them of financial stress and partner with them to, to create these wraparound services. Not every family is called by God to adopt, but every family can help encourage, walk beside, and contribute to these wraparound services if we go along this model. Now, I know you're thinking, what does this really have to do? Let me, let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. My dad was an orphan. He was given up for adoption at birth, but he got stuck in the foster care system, and he remained there for eight years. At the age of eight, the West family brought him in as a foster child, and three years later, he was adopted, and it was the first time that he ever had a mom or a dad. I wasn't really going to tell you that story today, <laughs> but the Lord kind of put it on my heart on the way over here, so I called my dad. This is interesting. I called my dad. I said, Dad, I want to tell your story today to church. It's just going to be a couple thousand people. <laughs> and uh, 
And I said, no, I just, I want to kind of get, you know, like say it was so many years ago or whatever. So, Dad, when were you born? He said, 1945. And I said, so the West family brought you in when you were eight, so that'd be 1953. Are you tracking with me? In 1953, God said, I want to build a church that's going to change the world. I'm going to call it Colonial. It's going to be right there, 1953. But I'm going to need a pastor for that church 60 years from now, and so I'm going to take this red-haired orphan and I'm going to put them with the West family. And I'm going to put them with the West family because there's a cute little six-year-old girl right next door named Marie, and they're going to get married. And they're going to have a son, and his name is going to be Jim, and he's going to pastor my church 60 years from now. You see, the difference of one human life, <laughs> one human life, one rescued orphan, one little forgotten lost coin that is found and brought in and nurtured and loved by a mom and a dad who are by no means perfect, but nevertheless put him on the path of fulfilling God's destiny, not only for that family and for that child, but even to this day for this church. I would not be standing here today if someone had not heard God's call to open their home to that little red-headed kid who turned out to be my dad, my best friend in the whole world. You can do this. Many of us can do this. If you're interested in being part of this foster adopt thing, we have families that are already doing it. Many of you, many of you have adopted. Please see Cynthia Lewis at our Quivira campus or just talk to one of the pastors. Now, I need to tell you something before I go on, in case you're thinking I'm just kind of off my rocker. So the session heard this vision from the Lord. We agreed we're going to move this way. So the next couple meetings I have with church members, you know, I have a lot of meetings. I'm a professional meteor <laughs> person. So the next three meetings I have are with people who are just started attending or joining our church. The first guy that I meet is the chairman of the homeless task force in Kansas City who has tremendous experience with the, Kansas, you know, with the foster adopt deal. The next family I meet just started a ministry in their home for kids who have graduated out of foster care. The next family that I meet says, we don't even know why we're here. And so I began to, you know, we explored for an hour. And finally I was like, well, we are going to kind of roll out a new vision here soon, and it has to do with foster adopt. And they both started weeping immediately on the, on the couch in my office. I said, well, what did I say? They said, we've been praying every day that God would just send us any unwanted children to our home. And I met a lady last week who said she's releasing a book on adoption. All these people just started attending our church. Is that random? No. You see, God has called us to this, and he's sending specialists who can help figure it out. This is how God works. I'm almost done. Hang in there. There's one last part of our vision, and it's compelling. You see, the parable of the lost coin, along with the Great Commission in Matthew 28, point us to those who have never heard of Jesus Christ throughout the world. These people are lost in their ignorance. Without a knowledge of Jesus Christ, without a personal relationship with him, millions of people all over the world are trapped under the oppression of darkness, and they suffer every day from the tyranny of one who does not love them, who cannot save them. Without an introduction to the saving power of Jesus Christ, these people groups are doomed to serve the dark Lord for all eternity. That's just how it is. Now, depending upon who you talk to, there are currently between four to 7,000 unreached people groups left in the world. Unreached people groups consist of those who have never heard the gospel in their native tongue. Our ability to reach the unreached has never been so great, nor has the urgency ever been so great. Within just the past couple of years, many of the world's greatest missionary organizations and leaders, who for years and years, for decades and decades, just worked in complete isolation from each other, Within the past couple of years, all of these leaders have heard the same thing and they have come together as one. You know what they heard? Finish it. And they are convinced and we are convinced that the Great Commission, that every people group, every tribe and tongue will hear the gospel, that it will be complete by the year 2025. 
your session and elders and your pastor are absolutely convinced that God is moving in an unprecedented way to reach those who have not heard, and we're being called to join him. God is sounding a trumpet commanding his church to complete the Great Commission and to do it now. The evidence is compelling. It's more than compelling. We have never heard of so many stories of Muslims, Hindus, and people all over the world coming to the faith as a result of dreams and visions where Jesus simply shows up to them uninvited and says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Follow me. We were hearing this story thousands and thousands of times. People are covered up in idol worship and they're being set free through the power of Jesus Christ. The church is exploding in regions of the world that were once completely close to the gospel. Countries like China, India, North Africa, Eastern Europe, and parts of the Middle East. This is where God is at work. And one thing I know about casting vision for the local church is you see where God's work, at work and then we just go there. You want to get in on what God is doing at reaching the unreached people groups of the world. This is, there's so much heat here. So we've been praying about this and studying it. After significant prayer and study, our elders are feeling called to engage in the country of India. India came onto my radar several months ago when a handful of India students joined our church at the Warnell campus. These beautiful young people were very focused on Jesus, and to this day, they take copious notes of my sermons, they go home and listen to the sermon online and take more notes. They're voracious students of the gospel because it's largely unheard of in their home country. India boasts a population of 1.2 billion people, 40%, listen, 40% of the population in India is under the age of 14. When are you most likely to receive Jesus Christ? In those years, right? One third of the world's unreached people groups are in the country of India. One third of the world's poor are in India. The average Indian citizen lives on 25 cents a day. India is in desperate need of Jesus Christ. Several weeks ago, I attended a citywide prayer meeting on a Thursday morning at Warnell. At the end of the meeting, a man named Pastor Sam Stevens walked to the microphone and began to share about his ministry in India. Pastor Sam is the president of an organization called India Gospel League, or IGL for short, and he is the third generation leader of IGL that was created by his grandfather in 1948. In 1992, IGL cast a vision for a number of indigenous church planters in India to plant 1,000 churches by the year 2000. So in eight years, they were going to plant 1,000 churches. Unheard of, right? In eight years, God moved in such a powerful way that they planted 20,000 churches. Since 2000 to present, they planted another 50,000 churches in India. Sam says, we can't explain it. We have never seen anything like it. We go in to these villages where nobody has ever been, where the gospel has never been proclaimed, and inevitably we'll find three to five people who gather every day to pray to the man in white because they've all had the same dream. Jesus is claiming his lost coins. He is absolutely fulfilling what he said he would do in Luke 15. And he's doing it through faithful indigenous church partners. Pastor, said, uh, Pastor Sam said that out of 7,000 indigenous church planters that they now have serving with them, 60% of those church planters came to the Lord through these amazing dreams, visions, and encounters with Jesus. These stories are surfacing every day. Well, Sam only spoke for about seven minutes but I had to run up and get his autograph. I mean, the guy was, I was so excited about what God was doing through him and his ministry. But later that day, I got a phone call from Sam's American host saying, hey, Sam wants to spend some time with you. I said, with me? I mean, this guy is like the Billy Graham of India. <laughs> I'm thinking, he wants to spend time with me. But I couldn't, I, mean, I was just covered up in meetings. Did I mention that I do a lot of meetings? So, so, the next day, um, it's my day off, I got all four kids, Chrissy's out of town, and I get a call, again, from the American host of, of Mr. Sam, Pastor Sam, he says, he really wants to spend time with you, I don't know what you said, but like, you guys really connected, so they came over to my house, and I got the Billy Graham Indian sitting at my kitchen table, and I literally had the boys all line up and said, this guy, you need to meet him, you know, <laughs> and he answered all my questions, and we had the most wonderful time of fellowship. And he brought in writing a proposal that he had come to Kansas City particularly to provide a proposal for Kansas City churches to engage in completing the Great Commission in India. <laughs> it's, 
And there wasn't much time to invite the elders into this conversation because I have like the Billy Graham of India sitting in my kitchen. There wasn't room for everybody. So here's what the proposal is. And I want you to know that since uh, that time, our session has vetted this with our mission board, and we are prepared to make this proposal to you as part of our all-in vision. And here's the proposal. That a number of churches in Kansas City, including us, partner with IGL to adopt four districts in the state of Orissa in the country of India with the goal of planning 580 churches in 580 unreached villages in five years. Now let me tell you a little something about Orissa. Orissa is famously known as the graveyard of Christianity. This would not be the first time that people tried to advance Christianity into Orissa. Unfortunately, it has been tried in the past. In 2008, Hindu extremists falsely accused a few Christians in that region for the murder of a famous Hindu official. Riots broke out, and consequently, over 60 Christian pastors were burned alive. Over 1,500 Christians were murdered. Over 4,000 homes were destroyed, and thousands were severely beaten and forced into exile in the jungles of Orissa. There are a number of videos on YouTube that show scenes from that uprising against the Christians in Orissa. That was only five years ago. Now Pastor Sam Stevens and the Indy Gospel League are prepared to re-enter Orissa, and they are asking the church in Kansas City to help. There are 580 villages in these four provinces or, or, or districts of Orissa that account for five million people. That's like twice the population of Kansas. Sam's goal is to plant one church in each of those villages in the next five years. Indian Creek Community Church, under the leadership of Pastor Gary Kendall, has already committed to the project. Pastor Gary has worked with Sam Stevens and IGL for over 20 years. Gary calls Sam Stevens the Billy Graham or the Bill Hobbles of India. <laughs> Pastor Gary and his wife, Belinda, have seen IGL's work firsthand. They came to our April session meeting to validate everything that IGL has presented to us in terms of their ministry, their methodology, their commitment to plant churches in unreached areas. You'll have a, an opportunity to hear from Pastor Gary in a few weeks because we're partnering with Indian Creek this year in the What If the Church movement. So our church has been invited to join Indian Creek and IGL and other churches in adopting this region in Orissa. Now, what does that mean to you? How can you be involved? Let me tell you. I'm asking every individual, family, or life group in our church to prayerfully consider sponsoring one of these 580 village church plants, which requires two levels of commitment. The first and primary level of commitment is intercessory prayer. In agreeing to sponsor a village church plant, you are committing to pray for the establishment of this particular church in that particular district every day for five years. If you will not commit to the intercessory prayer, you can't play. The prayer is the most important aspect of our partnership. You probably don't have the tools to imagine. I'm not sure that I do. But these villages in Orissa are animistic. What that means is that they blatantly worship idols. This, this is where darkness runs rampant in these villages, so many of them. So the prayer is absolutely essential. Satan has already assumed that all of these people belong to him. For these lost coins to be found, the power of intercessory prayer will be required. That's the number one ask. The second level of commitment is a financial pledge. You knew that was coming. Let me tell you, $300 a year for five years. That's, that's, that's the financial pledge per church. $300 a year for five years. I will tell you that one of our leaders here at the church has been so moved by God that his family is already committed to underwrite not one village, but an entire district of these church plants. So some of you who are sitting out there thinking, I'm on fixed income, and I, I don't have $300 a year. Look, you could take one of these villages, one of these 100 villages that's already been paid for, and just pray for it every day for five years, because that really is what is needed in this partnership. In addition to prayer and finances, there will be multiple opportunities each year to visit India, to serve with the IGL partners on the ground, or sponsor those who are going to India to serve. $300 a year per family, per village, pray every day, and we get to help to plant 580 churches in one of the darkest, most dangerous, idol-worshiping regions in the world. 
Personally, I would love to see Colonial adopt all 580 church plants in these four districts of Arissa. Not because I'm a hog, but because I think Colonial is a leader church. Most churches enter into a partnership like this incrementally. We're not an incremental church. I think if Colonial would step up and we had 580 families who would take on these villages and pray for them every day and come up with that minimal amount of support, I think other churches all over the city would match us. And we wouldn't just have the opportunity of reaching four districts in Arissa, we could reach the entire state of Arissa. The church in Kansas City taking all 30 districts in Arissa and praying them into the kingdom of heaven. I think that is a compelling vision and it will not let me go. All right, I'm about done. Now, I know that's a lot to take in. There's so much more going on in our church. I could go on for days about our work in Guatemala, the amazing ministries of our many partners locally and around the globe, our youth ministries, our children's ministries, the critically important role that life groups play in our church. I mean, you don't want to sit there as long as I want to talk. But there is so much that we're doing and so much that we must do. Listen, we are a blessed and delivered people, amen? For the past couple of years, God has been preparing us through the pounding of his gospel. Don't think that's lost on me. It pounds me too. We've all been pounded by the gospel for two years, right? But that has been preparation for us to come all in. And that's what we're doing. We're done playing defense. It's time to play some offense. We're done getting out of things. I don't want to lead you out of anything else. It's time to get into some things. It's time to storm the gates of hell in the name of Jesus and allow him to seek and save the lost through our church in our obedience. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I mean, this, I'm just going to look at some of your faces like, I don't know. Okay, look. This is a bold, difficult, and challenging vision. There aren't many rooms in Kansas City right now having this conversation. Because this is not the vision for a new church plant. This is not a vision for a church that's totally designed to be seeker sensitive. And I, have, I love every expression of the body of Christ. We need every last one of them here in our city. You see, but we are a 60-year-old church that has persevered for six decades. We have been through some stuff, amen? amen? We know who we are. We preach and teach the gospel. We disciple people and we send them out to go change the world. We love our kids and we raise them up to be leaders. We care for our own while we mobilize to save the world because of our age and the great legacy that God has entrusted to this church called Colonial, much is expected of us. We have been entrusted with much. And friends, make no mistake, much depends on us, more than you might think. We're not going to accomplish what God has in store for this church with half-hearted commitments. This is not a vision that can be accomplished by our excellent staff. This is not a vision that can be accomplished in our backstroke, in our leisure time. We have to go all in. The pursuit of this vision will change the way we live it will require a deeper sacrifice in terms of what we're willing to give up. Make no mistake, what God has set before us is going to be costly, difficult, and flat out hard. But my brothers and sisters in the Lord, we have been saved for this mission. This group of people in this room, every last soul here, you have been called in the name of Jesus Christ, for a time such as this. The time is short. Either this is the beginning of the greatest revival in the history of the world, or it is the beginning of the end. It is not a normal time. It is an extraordinary time. And extraordinary times call for extraordinary measures. It's time to come all in. Our master wants every chair filled at his banquet. 
We are the servants that he says, you go out there. You go into every nation and compel them to come in. It will take self-denial. It will take literally picking up your cross to follow him where he's leading us. Our Lord, Jesus Christ, is leading us to follow him into the dark places of this world. Who will follow? I will follow him. Are you all in? I believe you. Let's pray. Lord, this is not easy. This is hard. You're calling us to give up more than we've ever given up. You're calling us to a level of commitment that makes us uncomfortable. It's going to affect our comfort. It's going to affect our our income. It's going to affect the the, the dynamics of our homes. You're calling us to a level of commitment of prayer, of intercessory prayer for people we've never even met, places we've never been. But Jesus, we cannot deny that as we come to your word, if we actually believe that it's true, You gave us no quarter. You said all in or not at all. Discipleship demands that we obey, but we don't do so out of duty necessarily or just a sense of of fear that if we don't get it right, we're not gonna make it to heaven. Lord, we know that you went all in for us. You loved us so much that you gave up your very life, that you gave up heaven, that we might escape hell that you have saved us by your blood. You have set us apart. We are not a people trapped in darkness. We are not a people unaware of the hope of glory, Christ in us. And so we gather today as one church, united under God, indivisible, because of who you are. And you said, follow me. You said, Take up your, your cross. Count the cost. Come all in. And I pray, Lord, that in this room you'll find some 2,000 people who say, yes, Lord, I'm all in, and I don't even know what that means. I don't, I don't even have any idea what that's going to cost, but I know that your Holy Spirit is in this room and bringing conviction to my heart that you're not playing, that we're not just going through the motions of being a church, that you've called us to be light and salt, that we're, we're like a city on a hill that cannot be missed, that people would see you and they would find hope and souls would be saved and children found and rescued, and that even one life that comes out of this day might be the life that you choose to work through, to go and do who knows what. You are brilliant. You knew about this day, and I pray now that you will lead us to be all in. In Jesus' name.
whole self-indulgence. I loved it. It's good. <laughs> hey, uh, before we go, we want to make sure you recognize that we got some anxious mamas here. They're like, man, that picture went long. We need to get back and get our kids. And so if, if you would allow the mamas and daddies who have their kids at the nursery at Clavier to kind of scoot out first, that's your cue, mamas and daddies. Scoot out first, and that way we'll, we won't kind of block the way for them. They can, they can get out. And uh, we want to thank you again for coming and being part of our celebration today. Can we just say happy birthday? Happy birthday. Oh, and somebody's not going anywhere because I have your key. Uh, this says Seattle Pacific University. <laughs> All right, we got you. So we'll get that to you. Uh, it'll be just, we'll just, I'll have it. So come up. Well, here. I'm going to let, Jillian's going to take it to you. So she's down that way. Okay. All right. Can we just give our musicians a big hand and say thank you for them? Yeah. Thank you, guys. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Let me just say a good word over you, and we'll be on our way. Is that right? Good. Okay. So, Lord, if you would, we just pray for this continuing sense of blessing. It, we've had a tough challenge today, uh, just thinking about all the things you, that you're doing in the world and, and the fact that you're calling us to join you. And we pray that you just lead us to be a little bit more faithful today than we were yesterday. Keep working it out in each soul here, but together as a church, that we would be faithful, that we'd be bold, that we'd be all in. In Jesus' name, amen. Go in peace. Thank you.